entire life. The very first night the miracle worker ever happened, Nina was in it, as was her dad. And I went around with the program and got everybody to sign. And 20 years later, they were lamenting the fact that there was no program from the first night everybody had sang. And I said, I had one. And they said, we've looked for years. Nobody has one. I said, I was 11 years old, and I got everybody to sign, and I will give it to you. So Frank at the Helen Keller house is one that night that Neon is signed, and by that time, Neon's father had died. And not too long after the first performance. So you could never get another complete cast because they weren't all still with us. So anyway, I, Tuscumbia, and I was born in the Helen Keller Hospital. I count on the Tuscumbia side of the Helen Keller Hospital. Did you know that Mitch McConnell was born there? Yes. Did you know that? Did you know that uh, Fred Thompson from Tennessee, Senator Fred Thompson from Tennessee, was born there? I won't be specific, but you might need to burn the hospital down. And Percy, <laughs> and Percy Sledge worked there. Yeah, I knew that. Okay, uh, I'm a retired history teacher. I taught at Gadsden State for a zillion years, so long that I was teaching the children of people that I had taught. I'd be in class at the end of the first day, some big six foot four lanky kid would walk up and say, my mama told me to tell you who I am. And I'd say, okay, tell me who your mama is. And you remember so-and-so? Yes, and they had a sister and a brother, and you've got a so-and-so and so-and-so. And one thing they taught, three generations of the same thing. From the time I was a kid, I always loved old houses. I, I call myself a houseaholic. When we were traveling, my, my dad didn't get pooed about historic old stuff like that, but would humor me and take me and just say, I'll sit in the car, uh, you know, when you get through, come out and we'll go. But any time we were going anywhere, I would find out what was close to there that was something I wanted to go see. So I started doing my checkoff list of all the major old houses that you know, I wanted to go to, and I've done it my whole adult life. Um, I became fascinated with 19th century customs. And when I taught American history, when I was in school, all you had was so much military stuff and battles and who died where and all that kind of stuff. The interesting stuff to me was what did their house look like? What did they live like every day? What was it like? What did you have for a meal? There were three of us in my department who were history teachers, and I said, one can tell you all about the politics, and one can tell you all about the military stuff, and I can tell you what the Kurtz looked like. <laughs> so we kind of split up what our approaches were. We, I mean, we, we all covered the basic stuff, but my thing was always to throw in those kinds of things. And I would show programs on places like Monticello or Mount Vernon or various places that I had been to and talk about what the things were like. And years later, I would run into students or I would get a, they would find me online and they would say, I was driving through Virginia with my family and I got them to take me to Monticello. Or I was going to Washington, D.C., and I said to my family, oh, can we please go to Mount Vernon? I know it's close. So I thought, good, I had inspired another, another generation of folks to go to historic places. I can remember Belmont when it was falling in, so it's just a miracle to me that it was saved. So I'm delighted that it's here. What was it like in the 19th century to go to a house for a fancy meal? Well, if you wanted to impress your company, you pulled out all of the stops. You got out every good thing that you had and, and laid it all out. Um, and we just don't do that kind of entertaining thing. Young kids don't want things you can't put in the dishwasher, that you can't put in the microwave, or anything that has to be polished. So everybody has pewter or stainless or microwavable crate and barrel kind of china. And if you look at the prices of some of these kinds of chinas that brides would have picked out in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, they're giveaway things sometimes. I've been to a state sales where an entire set of china on half price day was two hundred dollars, and probably when all the pieces were bought was fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars worth of china. Um, silverware the same way. There was a utensil or a dish for almost everything you could think of. I set the table as if it were going to be a six-course meal, and each place is one of the six courses. I'll talk about it as I go around and explain what each one was. But this is only a six-course meal. It was not uncommon to have a 16-course meal and a meal to last three hours long. Um, dishes that we don't even think about serving now. Um, bone marrow. Can you imagine scooping out bone marrow? There was a special little sterling tool. It was a marrow scoop that you pulled it out with. There was a special fork to eat terrapin soup with, uh, terrapin in soup with. Um, there are ice cream forks. There are strawberry forks. There are cocktail forks. I mean, everything you can think of. 
The pattern that's on the table here is Francis I by Raymond Barton. It's not a 19th century pattern, it's an early 20th century pattern, it's about 1906. It's the most complete service ever made in the United States by any manufacturer. There are almost 300 serving pieces in just this one pattern. Um, again, for things that nobody uses them for anymore, but they made a piece at that particular time. Um, they vary from, I've laid over here a little tiny one, they vary from the tiniest piece which is an individual salt spoon. This is one thing I have never used, where you have a little salt cellar, you pick it up and you shake it, do it. Yes, they're cute, but they're impractical to use. But that's the tiniest piece they made. Uh, the biggest piece they made is the stuffing spoon. How about that for a spoon? <laughs> it has a little ball on the back, and this is so it won't slide down off the tray or the container that what you're serving, whatever you're dipping out of, you just like to get the stuffing out of the inside of a turkey. Mm -hmm. But this was the biggest piece that they made. Um, the china that you see on the table is, an, is a 19th century Austrian set. I was at an estate sale, I was at a teacher's conference in South Alabama, and I was on the way to uh, a meal. And I saw a sign with an arrow that said a state sale. This is like waving drugs in front of a drug addict for me. I just thought, whoa, can I get to that? So I went and looked and I saw some wonderful things and I thought, tomorrow's half price day. If I'm here when they open tomorrow, I could really get some bargains. And this set was one of those things. I've never seen a set, a 19th century set with this many serving pieces. Look at all the pieces on both of the sideboards that are the covered pieces. We don't think about having covered pieces now because we serve it directly from the stove. It's not like you're bringing it from another building. But when the kitchen was out here in a separate place and you had to come from there into this side door to bring it in, to cover it would help to keep it warm. When I do a fancy meal, I do a served plate. The plate is put before you with everything on it that you're going to eat arranged exactly like I want it to look like when it's on the plate. And in the proportion size, I think what's probably what you're going to eat. And if I've served you multiple courses, I, I'd serve smaller helpings because you're eating lots of stuff. Uh, when the century was going to change, we talked about my sister and I, what would we do that would be special to remember you did on that night in 1999? And I read about this fabulous dinner somebody had that had 11 courses. And we thought, okay, let's replicate that. Talk about a production. When I do my table for 12 people for a six course served meal, I counted one time how many separate things I had used. It was about 280. If you counted up all the utensils, if you counted up all the service plates, because every course had a plate that went underneath it. And as the soup bowl left, so did the underplate of the soup bowl. As the sorbet thing left, so did its underplate go. In the 19th century, that's why people had such huge services of China. It's not uncommon for a multi-course meal to use three dinner plates per person. The largest plate on the bottom, we commonly call this thing a charger now, but in the 19th century there would have been what was called a service plate. It looked like your regular china, it just was a much bigger one. If you see a picture of the White House set up for a steak dinner, there is a service plate in everybody's place. When you come in, that is sitting there. It was considered to be very inhospitable to have an empty place in front of you. If there was nothing on the table and you sat down to that, it was like, well, there's nothing here. So the service plate was always that. On top of the service plate, on, in this case, the charger, dollies were very popular in the 19th century. Everybody remember in, when you went to teas in the 50s and 60s, and everybody put dollies on all the little trays of the tea sandwiches and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they were very popular in the 19th century because you didn't want to scratch things, and that kept it from happening. I had put all the dinner plates on the table to start with just as an underplate, and I'll explain to you what all the separate other pieces are on there. Uh, the number of courses could vary from uh, four, up, as I said, to 16, 18. I've even read of 20, 20 plus courses for some meals. Uh, the art of setting a table was, was a, a big deal in the 19th century. And one of the ultimate, compliment, ultimate compliments you could, you could say about a lady was that she set a beautiful table. And when people came to see you, they noticed all the little details. 
And all of my mother's little older friends are all gone but two. But there were a couple of them I always loved to come to our house when we had a fancy meal. Because some of those little unusual things that I would do, they would always notice and comment on because it had been something their parents had done way back then too. Um, let me start with the course, the first course down here on the end. I always have as my first course a shrimp cocktail. Uh, you could have had in the 19th century, perhaps because we had mussels in mussel shows, you could have had a course that served mussels. Oysters were brought up from the coast on ice. There's an oyster plate. They fit in each one of the little slots and the sauce would have gone in the middle. But again, there was a special plate for everything. One of my favorite ones ever, when Rutherford B. Hayes was president, had a dessert service made and the trays that ice cream balls were served on were shaped like snowshoes. Isn't that perfect to have balls of, balls of white ice cream on top of that? Uh, you could serve a shrimp cocktail or another thing in a low little dish like this, like a berry bow. You could serve it in a pedestal. And if you were real fancy, you had a silver version of it. This is a sterling one that's shot with gold. It's lined with a gold wash on the inside. And people noticed those things. Did you have silver? Did you have gold washed silver. The ultimate was did you have gold? This is sterling dipped in gold. This was, the, this was the most highly noticed thing that you could have. I've never sat down to a meal in a house with gilded sterling except in my house. I found this at an estate sale in Birmingham and thought I had died and gone to silver heaven. <laughs> it's my favorite pattern on earth. My sister picked it when she got married. And my mother said, well, my pattern will just be yours so I didn't get to pick anything. And this is the one I always loved. And I walked in and saw it across the room, and I thought it was that Filipino mm -hmm. stuff that's cheap, that's brass looking. And I walked up to it and I thought, well, that looks kind of like Francis the First. And I got real close to it and I thought, that's a really good copy. And I flipped it over and it said, Reading Barton Sterling. It was a Depends moment. I was so excited when I realized it was service for 12. I added to it some of the pieces that they did not have. But this is what they always use at the White House. When you see them set up for a state dinner, they have what's called vermeil, gilded sterling. And traditionally in France, it was cleaned in champagne. Doesn't that sound weird? You didn't wash it. You dipped it in champagne and dried it. Um, the size of silverware was dictated by the meal. We don't think about having multiple sets of silver in the same pattern now in different sizes. But there was a luncheon size and there was a dinner size. The difference in the two, this is not a luncheon fork, this is what's called a place fork. By the 1940s, when nobody had double sets anymore, the silver companies went to an in-between size. They split the difference and they called it place. This is place. A luncheon fork would be a little smaller than this. And this is a dinner fork. See how much bigger it is? And they're very heavy. Uh, I mix and match, they're all the same pattern. The, the, Big forks just happened to be not gilded. I already had them, but I mix and match. It was not uncommon to have one piece on the table turned upside down. So when you see a piece like that turned upside down and you wonder why, silverware is not always fully finished on the back. It might be plain on the back. This is a pattern that's in the round. It's fully detailed on the back side too. It's just blank right here. It's blank right here because you couldn't monogram it here, but you could here. So if you wanted the monogram to show, you turned at least one piece up so that was visible to the people when they came to the table. Okay, shrimp cocktail would have been my first course here. The fork you ate it with, the little cocktail fork, you always think about forks being on the left-hand side, but popularly in the 19th century, this one fork could be placed on the right-hand side if you served soup and you put it in the bowl of the spoon. So when you notice the table for why that was on this side and not the other side, that's the reason why. It's just an odd quirk when I sit at my table that I always do and people always ask about it if I post a picture somewhere online. Tell me about why the fork's on that side. Because that's the way it was done in the 19th century. Okay, when this was taken away, this and what it was with would go away as would its utensil. Okay, then when we come to the second course. The second course I always serve is the soup course. While they're busy with the shrimp cocktail, I have that one made up in advance and it's in the refrigerator waiting. You're watching this one at the last minute, so you've got some time to kill with that one while you're getting the next one ready. This set has the soup bowls with it too from the 19th century. And 
Soup spoons came in different shapes. This is a round bowl soup spoon. They made an oval bowl soup spoon. I think oval bowl soup spoons just look like a big teaspoon. So I always like the round ones because it's so obvious that it is a soup spoon. They made a smaller version of this with a much smaller round bowl. It's a bouillon spoon. You know when you see bouillon cups, like a little cup that has two handles on either side? That smaller size one is what you use with, with the bouillon cup. This is what you use for soup. Butter. I have individual butter dishes at each place. They could be in your china, or if you had some bucks, they could be silver too. I have shown something that you wouldn't have done back then. I've shown a butter pat, and I've shown a butter and bread and butter plate. If you used the plate, and everybody had their own individual little butter knife, the butter might already have been put onto here, waiting for when the roll was served. If butter was going to be, if the roll was going to go on your plate for a meal, this is what the butter went on. This little tiny thing is a butter pat. Almost nobody makes butter pets anymore. No China companies do. You know, you know Rosenthal, the German manufacturer? Rosenthal's still in business. They've been around forever. But some Rosenthal patterns still do produce a butter pet. This set had them, which is very unusual because it's one of the first things. Cups and saucers in these were the most commonly broken things. Cups in these were the most commonly broken things. But I put them out just to show that it was an alternative to what that was. People always wonder what these little things are. These are individual nut bones. And these are also in Francis I, the pattern that the flatware is. And that was just a little treat you put out for your guests at each place. Uh, you could put candies, you could put nuts, you could put lots of things, but it's officially called a nut dish. There was a master nut bowl, a bigger one, and then there was a nut spoon, a specially made piece just to pick up nuts with. And lots of people in their serving patterns, when people used to entertain a lot, have a nut spoon. I laid it somewhere. I've got so many pieces I can get left out of them. Let me see. Here. You may have seen these that have little open stuff, so salt stuff would fall through the hole. Your grandmother may have had this in her silver box with her, with her other serving pieces, but this was what went in the master nut bowl to fill all of those small nut bowls. Uh, when you served butter, this is the 19th century butter dish that goes with this set. And it has its original ring on the inside, its original liner. That was to put, when you unmolded the butter from an old butter mold like this, when you unmolded the butter and pushed it out, it sat on that. And because it had been chilled, if you had a spring house, it would have been cool. It would have been condensation on it. That's what this is for to let the condensation drop down to the bottom of the boat. This is the master butter knife. If you were going to whack a piece of it off and put it onto your place, this is what you would use to do it with. And this is what we would use for a butter dish now because we get butter in a stick. So commonly we would put it in a little thing like this and do that. So most people have a, have a shape like this. So I put it out in contrast to show you what the 19th century version of it looked like. Uh, if the butter were to be on, I keep laying my stuff down, if the butter were to be already on, already prepared, where this little thing is, you might be bringing in butter curls or butter balls. Anybody ever seen where they've taken a, a scraper and scraped across and made a roll of butter? Sometimes in real fancy restaurants they bring little butter balls in a bowl. This is a butter pick. This little twisted thing on the end is what you stuck it with to then put it on to your own individual little place. So again, they made one of everything you could think of. Obscure that some of them are. Uh, very spicy mustard was a popular condiment sometimes. That's what this little tiny spoon is for. Because you know some of those things have a killer heat kickback on them and you didn't take very much of it. So that's why the bowl is so tiny. Mustard dishes are very small little things with a lid and usually have a little porcelain label on the inside, but this is the sterling version of the porcelain one. <coughs> uh, salt and pepper. I've shown the big versions on the table at each end. I've got a pair that are prelude here and Strasbourg down here, but you also sometimes had individual salt and pepper shakers. At each place, each person had their own little pair of these. 
They are the devil to fill up. And the headache after you've used them is you can't leave salt and silver, so you have to empty them all the time. So I've got them because my mother had them. I never use these. I always use the big ones. And again, I never use the open top ones because who wants people spilling salt across the table while you're shaking that little thing trying to do all of that? Um, okay, after the soup course, was this, this, would be, this would be taken away. The soup spoon would be taken away. Then the next course, you need to cleanse your palate after you've had some of these things. You're preparing for what's going to be the entree. So the little sherbet dish here would have had maybe some kind of custard or if it was the time of the year when you could have a sorbet, some kind of a sorbet thing. Uh, with maybe a few little berries on it. You could pick some blackberries out here in the woods and sprinkle two or three of them on that. That was just a little refreshing thing to have. And again, it went away with its little thing when you left. And if you were serving something that needed a gravy or a sauce, this is the gravy boat with the attached plate that goes with this service. You find sometimes this dish is separate from the base and lifts off and sometimes they're made together. This is the gravy ladle that goes with it. And this one is a two-piece set, and this is just a plated one. This is not an expensive one. But this was where you could pour it but not use a ladle. When you then got to the entree, this is the plate it would have been served on. And if you had double sets of plates, when that plate was brought in, this is all that's left in, uh, wait a minute, that's the entree. I've, I've mixed up one course. This is the salad. I put it in the wrong course. After you had the soup, then you had the salad. Then you had the sorbet here before the main course was coming. When you got to the main course, the only plate left at your place was the dinner plate. This is why you oftentimes had a huge set of dinner plates. When the plate was brought and served, this one was picked up as that one was put in front of you, so you were not left with an empty place. Okay, how did you serve a meal? If you had lots of help, you could plate everything like that and bring it to the table already to serve. If you did not, in a dining room the size of this, this table would normally be set up long ways this way. You would have, sometimes on these pieces, all of these would be lined up. And you would get up and help yourself. You would put onto the plate what you wanted of those things. All the platters, all the different size platters. This is the soup tureen with the soup ladle and the cutout place for it. But the variety that people had was phenomenal. We think about now you have an entree. Okay, what are we having? We're having ham. What are we having? We're having roast beef. If you sat down to a meal in the 19th century, there might have been something beef, there might have been something pork, there might have been something that was wild game, pheasant or partridge, all. And you had your choice of those things. Um, and for vegetables, it was around here, it would have been what did you grow yourself? You would have had real exotic kinds of things. You would have had corn and beans and potatoes and things that we are used to, you know, eating in the, in the south. But I, like I never had asparagus till, uh, fresh asparagus till I went to college. I, I had seen it in the can. Mother would make it sometimes for a special occasion in a casserole, but I, the stores didn't carry it. I never ate broccoli till I went to college because nobody grew broccoli in Copper County that I knew of. So uh, back then they would have what was available for those kinds of things. And that's why under a house like this there would have been a root cellar. What'd you do in the fall? You, gathered up all your things you could put back. You took apples and you wrapped them in paper. You took green tomatoes and you put them back so they could slowly ripen. You dug your potatoes and put them back. Um, you could can some things, but some things you just kept. Potatoes and things like that for, for a month or two, you could just keep those things back. And if they were in a chilled place like under the house, it'd be fairly safe. Um, I told you there was a utensil, a utensil for everything. There was a utensil for every age person too. So unique to me are all the things to feed children with. And Vanna will now jump up and be my assistant. And she will walk around and show you. On the tray, I've lined them up in the order of age. The first one is an infant feeder. Looks like an iced teaspoon. Real long thing. That's the infant feeder. 
Then the next one that has a little curved wraparound handle, that's when the little kid was old enough to stick their own finger in there and get it to their own face, sort of. Okay, after they had done that, they graduated to the little kid set of spoon and fork. I've got my little set that I had when I was a kid. My sister has her little set. That's a set that matches this pattern. And then, when you were a youth size, there was a miniature version of these, and that's what the three-piece set is. So, they thought of everything. Um, kids oftentimes were not in the main room with adults when a meal was served. I can remember as a kid, when I was growing up, my grandmother didn't have a children's table, which a lot of people did. But you hear about people having... This is when you're like toddlers. You hear about people having a children's table. In a separate room, a table was set up, and whoever was tending to the children was seeing to them having their meal. But they were not commonly in the dining room with adults. They might have been for a special occasion at tables over in the side, but they wouldn't have been at the big table. Oh, let me set this one out of over here. I told you that there was a utensil for everything. I brought just a selection of some of the more interesting looking of those utensils. I love the ones that are pierced. This is an asparagus server, and she'll walk around with the tray. This is an asparagus server. This huge thing is a fish set. This is a fish slice and a fish fork. I do not like fish. I never serve it, but I couldn't resist getting these. I was at an antique show one time, and a woman had all these odd serving pieces, and they were such a bargain. And I said, Shalane, I can't believe these are this price. And she said, I hit lucky at an estate sale, and I'm passing the bargain on to my, to my customers. So I thought, okay, God means for me to have this. Um, this is a berry spoon. If you serve assorted fruit, if you had melons and grapes and things like that in a bowl, this is the spoon that you used for that. This flat one is a tomato server. This is a very unusual one. This one is for oyster crackers. Uh, not so commonly down here where we are, but when people have stuff like clam chowder and those kinds of things in the north, you eat little crackers in them, and this is the spoon to dip that up with. This is a sardine server. Isn't that a weird one? This is a pie server. Beautifully detailed. And this one, I have no clue what it is. I've looked up all the things I can find, and I have not found what this one is. This fancy little swirly spoon, what it was for, I don't know. But it obviously was not one that you ate with. It was to serve something special with. And my favorite of all, this is the most beautiful piece to me in Francis. This is the jelly cake server. It was a long, thin slice like a cheesecake piece would be. And that's why like such a long, pointy little tapered thing. But Vanna will now pass them on you and let you look real carefully. Yeah, so I can... It's, it's, it's both ways. Oh. I've got them hanging, hanging both ways. Um, <coughs> it's slim, I'm sorry. At each place you, you see three, three beverage things. There would have been in the 19th century. What is that one? Is that the one you said you didn't know? That's the one you said you didn't know. That's the one I don't know. This is a potato server, I think. I meant to um, say potato server. <laughs> I have shown the tea glass because we can't live in the South without tea. It's just, it's, there's water and there's tea and those are just part of life. And it's got to be sweet for me because I don't like unsweetened tea. But I have shown a tea glass. It would have been probably a stemmed glass in place of that. And tea would not have been served at an evening meal. There would have been some kind of a wine. Uh, I'm not Mr. Lecker, so I don't ever have wine glasses out. I do, I do serve sparkling grape juice sometimes with dessert. And on the rarest of occasion, I sometimes have put champagne in the glass, but I don't like it, so I don't usually serve it. The silver goblets are from water. They were standardly used at all meals. The napkins, what did people use in the 19th century for napkins? <laughs> they use really big napkins. Okay, I'm a lady and I'm sitting down and I have on my big fancy nice little dress. What do I want to do? I want to make sure that I have covered everything up. You couldn't go you couldn't go to the cleaners and have something dry clean. So you've got to be very careful about getting the spot on anything. Oh, uh, 
So this is a dinner napkin. We don't usually Beautiful. use napkins this big anymore. This is not even a big dinner napkin. Some bigger, nap bigger dinner napkins are actually the size of a small